You can learn almost everything you need to know about economics from Art Laffer, creator of the famous Laffer Curve. And you can also learn a lot from Art that you haven't thought about much, but should. Like, why does he think most of us ought to move to Tennessee? Or why do we have the highest taxes on our most successful companies? Or <laughs> what body part best describes the famous Laffer Curve? And uh, which American presidents got economic policy right? And which four presidents does he call the Four Stooges? <laughs> Art Laffer shows us how his four pillars of prosperity can prevent the mistakes of the Four Stooge presidencies. Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists, and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics, and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. Everything in today's America seems to have become political. Economics, education, art, music, and in recent years, even the weather. ESPN now has made sports political, and I believe this is toxic. When things get cast in political terms, life becomes a zero-sum game. The political class dividing up what they see as a fixed pie trying to mandate results and outcomes rather than creating incentives for innovation and growth. But things are framed by politics, and this program inevitably strays into politics. The aim, though, is to get into issues that touch on them without also getting toxic. For example, economics. The classical term for economics is political economy. One of America's greatest economists tells us that good political economics is neither left-wing nor right-wing. It is not liberal, it's not conservative, and goodness knows it's not Republican or Democrat. It's just plain, straightforward economics. And good economics always turns out to be, ultimately, good politics. With me today is the author of those words, Dr. Arthur Laffer. Dr. Laffer, who earned his PhD in economics from Stanford University, is the founder and chairman of Laffer Associates, an economic research and consulting firm. He served on President Ronald Reagan's Economic Policy Advisory Board for both of President Reagan's terms as president. Dr. Laffer was also an advisor to Donald Trump's successful 2016 campaign for the presidency of the United States. Dr. Laffer created, which is probably the best visualization of effective income tax policy, the Laffer Curve. His economic acumen and influence triggered a worldwide tax-cutting movement in the 1980s that has earned him the distinction as the father of supply-side economics. Among his many publications, he is the co-author of The End of Prosperity and The Return to Prosperity. And among other things, we'll be talking today about his forthcoming book, A Template for Understanding the Economy. Art, welcome. Thank you very much, Bill. I could go on listening to you all day. I loved it. If I'm not just easy with you. Thank well, you. I, that's a, that was a pretty brief summary of everything you've done. Very nice, though. Thank you very much. <laughs> so politics, it's not or economics, it's not political. No, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. I mean, incentives are what economics is all about. And uh, people like doing things they find attractive. And they dislike doing things they find unattractive. And government policies can affect the attractiveness of an activity. For example, if you tax something, you make it less attractive and people will do less of it. If you subsidize an activity, you make it more attractive and people will do more of it. And that's why it's very dangerous when you tax people who work and you pay people who don't work. I mean, I hope I'm, if you have two locations, A and B, and you raise taxes in B and lower them in A, producers and manufacturers and people are gonna move from B to A. Now, we're seeing that working out in the states. You've done a lot Beautiful. of work on, yes. on states and the difference in policies in one state to the next, and we're seeing people actually moving, people leaving California. They really do, and I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did move. You moved oh, from I moved California. Oh, I moved from Rancho Santa Fe, California, yeah. uh, yeah. to Nashville, Tennessee, for one reason. There's no income tax in Tennessee. I paid for my house in Nashville with my first year's tax savings. And no mortgage. I mean, it's a no-brainer, as Larry Gatlin says. It ain't rocket surgery, Art. <laughs> and I, it's just, and everyone else is doing the same thing. Be, you know, people like making money and keeping it. 
So your book, though, the, the one that I'm looking forward to seeing, The Template for Economics, uh, Understanding the Economy, you've got a section in there on states. Yes. And what, describe what's in that. Well, uh, first, the first page of it, of the states thing, is there are nine states in the U.S. that do not have an earned income tax. Now, two of those states had an unearned income tax, New Hampshire and Tennessee, but we in Tennessee just got rid of our unearned income tax. Now, for those non-economists, an earned income tax is just regular yeah, income, your wages. wages. No income tax on wages, And non-earned income tax is capital gains. Dividends, capital gains, okay. other for royalties, yeah. that type of stuff. If you look at the nine states with no income tax and compare it with the nine states that have the highest income tax rates, if you look at those two groups, the highest and the lowest group, the nine states without an income tax beat the living bejabers out of the nine highest income tax states, if you take a 10-year period, in every single metric. Population growth, gross state product growth, and even tax revenues they do better than. It's just amazing. I took these numbers back 50 years. Every single year, now using the 10-year moving average, mm -hmm. every single year, the zero income tax rate states have beaten the equivalent number of the highest income tax rate states in every single metric you can measure. It's just amazing how that works. Uh, I then did one, which you might find fun too. Uh, I looked at those 11 states that have introduced the income tax mm -hmm. since 1960. It started off with West Virginia. All right, and the last one is Connecticut. And then you have states like Maine and like Connecticut, of course, I mentioned that, Rhode Island, you have uh, 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 Pennsylvania, you have Ohio, you have Michigan, you have Indiana, you have Nebraska, you have all the Illinois, all these states that have introduced an income tax. What I did very simply is I looked at those states in the year they introduced the income tax and what their performance had been. Performance is measured by? Uh, measured by economic growth, okay. population, all of these. Our favorite, our favorite jobs? Our jobs. Yeah. I look at a labor force, jobs, yeah. total output, all of these. And I also include tax revenues. And I looked at each of these states compared to the rest of the nation. Of those 11 states that introduced the income tax in the last, what, 57 years, mm -hmm. every single one of those states has declined relative to the rest of the nation. Every single one of them in every single one of those metrics. Some of those states have declined by a lot. I mean, Romney was the one who put the income tax in in Michigan. You can't believe it. In Detroit in 1950 was a city the size of 1.85 million people. Mm -hmm. Today it's 650,000. This may be a good point to talk about the Laffer curve. I mean, the Laffer curve, I think, is one of the best ways to understand how tax revenue can go up, up to a certain point, and then beyond that point it goes down. Yes. Do you elaborate on that? Sure. I mean, there are two effects tax rates have on revenues. Uh, one is if you raise tax rates, you do collect more money per dollar of tax base. That's true. Mm -hmm. So that's positive. That's the, that's the arithmetic effect. But then there's also the economic effect, which if you raise tax rates on an activity, you, you make that activity less attractive and people do less of it. These two effects always work in the opposite direction from each other. Sometimes when you raise tax rates, the arithmetic effect wins and you collect more revenues. But sometimes when you raise tax rates, uh, the economic effect wins and you lower the base by a larger percentage than you increase the rate and you lose revenues. And everyone understands you can overprice your product and make no money. Well, is there a rate? It. I mean, we, we talk about a curve. The rate goes up to a certain point and then it becomes counterproductive yes. and you get lower revenues. Is there a number? Is there well, a percentage? I, I did, is it 18%? I did percent? A, is well, it 22? I did the thing is is a it, pedag pedagogy device for my students just to get them to understand right. the two effects. So I made a little effort, which sort of looks like my profile. If you're oh, figuring. it looks like a little curve, a, a little, like little, a little belly. belly curve. Yes, yeah, thank okay. you. Well, I don't the, think uh, you quite look like that. But I did that, that but... uh, and uh, just for <laughs> illustrating the principle. But yeah, you can see a lot of tax for capital gains is obviously way in the prohibitive range. Yeah, for those who want a better visualization, it's like an egg on its side cut in half, Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Th that's just pedagogic. I, I would guess those tax rates. I'm the trying court. to move off your tummy. Yeah, just thank you. For okay. <laughs> I'm trying to move off it my, my whole life. Well, you, how do you stay so slim and trim? And I have all this. Well, never mind. Anyway. The, uh, but, but the curve is a good pedagogic device to explain to congressmen, to explain to senators, to explain to just students. Yeah. That, you know, there, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch, as my colleague Milton Friedman always would say. So and, there's a, uh, you know, there's a, an example though that seem, there's a state that seems to have gotten it wrong, and that state is Kansas. And we talked about this a little yeah. bit before the show. I mean, what's what's 
Sam Brownback lowered taxes, but there's a lot of other things that work in Kansas that offset that. What Could you describe oh, sure. what the Kansas the situation place, is? It was a huge political— Except that it's home to Wyatt Earp, or was— Yeah, it's home to Wyatt Earp and okay. Dorothy, and Dorothy, of course— Dorothy, from Oz, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, uh, uh, he For his first proposal, I think, was a $90 million tax cut that he had proposed. And uh, Kansas is all Republicans. I mean, there are a couple of Democrats there, but not many, never have been. Uh, a lot of the Republicans were against Sam Brownback for— personal reasons. It wasn't that they were rhinos or anything. They, they were just these personality clashes that happened, and they wouldn't pass his bill. So, so this is Republicans versus Republicans it's in Republicans Kansas. Versus, okay. And not even ideological. Yeah. I mean, when I would go down there and talk with the senators there, they would say they had a better bill than Sam's. And it, they may be right. It, it may be. But, you know, you should never let the best be the enemy of the good. And what happened was in the primary, the Republican primary, they threw out a bunch of these Republican senators and they swept them out. So Sam had total control. Before the change occurred, they passed a bill in the Senate, which increased the tax cut to $250 million. Hmm. So they way increased it. He had kept the higher sales tax rate. They dropped it back down. They did all this stuff, begging him to veto it. Well, he didn't veto it. He signed it. And then, of course, you had all sorts of problems arise in Kansas. You had the Supreme Court requiring a lot more funding for schools. You had a big forecast error in 2012 on capital gains on unearned income, which caused a huge shortfall. And by the way, 40 other states did the same thing. And, and then, you had, then you had all sorts of problems with their pension fund, which he had to fund to bring it up. It was in the 49th in the nation. Well, as I Agricultural had, prices and oil prices yeah. dropped, which just killed the Kansas economy. But the bottom line is when you look at the tax cut that he did, it was fine. I mean, it was a little tax cut in a sort of backwater state, a very small state economically. Well, the underside, <coughs> the underside of the Laffer curve is that if you drop rates too much, you do lose revenue. Oh, you and do. That's kind yes. of where, that's what happened. So there is an optimal point. I don't know that that you was the know? tax rates on this one. Okay. He dropped it just a, I mean, it wasn't a big tax cut. It wasn't like Prop 13 in California. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't like any of these others. I mean, when I look at Kansas and the lesson coming from Kansas, it's a minor lesson compared to Illinois, compared to Connecticut, compared to Kentucky, compared to West Virginia, compared to Michigan, compared to California. These are huge tax-driven states. Kansas was not a huge tax-driven state. And uh, frankly, I don't think there was much of a lesson in there except for political lesson. One, one of the things I don't think a lot of us understand is how the federal tax code subsidizes these high-income tax oh, they states. Do. Ex would you explain that? Sure. Well, you get to deduct your state taxes on your federal tax return. So if I'm paying 15 percent in New York, I can deduct all that from my federal? It, it, not totally, but yes, you can. Generally. You can deduct that, but then you have the alternative minimum tax where state, state taxes are not a preferred item, so therefore you have to factor that back in. But bottom line— Okay, but line, that's a detail. We, and, but it's a big detail, but yeah. yes, it is. Uh, but the federal government subsidizes states with high income tax rates. They do. California, New York, Illinois, these states, they subsidize those with your tax dollars from other states. Oh, mm -hmm. by the way, you're, you're, you're in a pretty high one, too. So I, don't, <laughs> I mean, this is the IQ test I ask people, where do they live? So why am I not living in Tennessee? Indeed. Okay. That's my question. Well, I heard, That's I, the first IQ test I have a lot of friends question. in Tennessee. It's, it's yes, a great state. It's good. And, uh, and you get to keep, part, you know, <laughs> making money is a lot more fun at lower taxes. <laughs> I'm for that. Me too. That's what I mean about economics not being political, right? <laughs> it doesn't. And, you know, we have the fastest growth in Tennessee. Uh, we have the best improvement in public services in the nation. We have fully funded pension funds. Yeah. Uh, we ran a surplus this last year, $2 billion. And, you know, we have the lowest tax rates of any state. We're just doing fine. So the you. tax revenue comes from property taxes? No, yeah. property taxes are one of the lowest in the nation as well. Okay. We have a sales tax. All right. With almost no exemptions. It's a broad-based flat tax that really works. It's our workhorse. And then we have the lowest number, one of the lowest numbers of, of public employees per 10,000 population. We have the lowest, one, one of the five or seven lowest pay of those employees. We still have long lines. Yeah. And our education system, our highways, we went from 37th in the nation to 7th in the nation in highways. Well, let me try this out. People talk about getting rid of the income tax nationally and going to a VAT tax. And it seems like Tennessee has experimented with something like that. That's exactly what we do. Yeah. Yeah, and it works. As long as you make your VAT tax comprehensive. VAT means value-added tax. Yeah, well, I use a sales, sales tax. tax. Sales tax, similar, same thing. Yeah, okay. Uh, you, you started out in life as a Democrat. 
And for all I know, you may still be a Democrat. I'm not sure. I don't I'm know sure. what started in life. Okay. There was a moment in there. Was there I a worked moment? With Democrats okay. a lot. Uh, I've been basically economics driven. I loved Kennedy. I loved Clinton, and I loved Reagan. I mean, they all were tax cutters. And I also <laughs> heard you thought Clinton did a pretty good job economically. As he president. did. No, yeah. I voted for him twice. Yeah. yeah. Now God knows I didn't vote in that party's primary. And I would not have allowed my daughter to intern in that White House, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Just joking. But, but he was a damn good president. Yeah. He really was. I mean, he cut taxes a lot. He got rid of the retirement test on Social Security. He cut the capital gains tax to 15%. He got rid of the capital gains tax on owner-occupied homes completely. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. He did the welfare reform where you actually have to look for a job to get welfare. I mean, <clears throat> Who does that? Clinton did. I mean, he, he was an amazingly good president in economics. Now you've got a great chapter in your book on, uh, or maybe a couple chapters on, on Reagan slash Kennedy versus Obama. I mean, would you give me a compare and contrast there? Sure. When we took office... Uh, we meaning... Reagan. Reagan, when you're Excuse working me. for... Yeah. <laughs> Hope he's still my We'll have a moment you know, yeah, He dropped the highest tax rate. Now I'm talking about the Steiger Hansen, but we dropped sure. the highest tax rate from 70%. Uh, down to 28%. Yeah. You know, we did all the tax reforms there, and I could just take you through all of them there. And Obama did just the reverse. Uh, Obama raised taxes, increased regulations, and uh, increased government spending dramatically. Uh, if you look at the results, I mean, the growth rate from the NBER trough in Reagan to the NBER trough on Obama, the difference in growth rates is 4.7% Reagan, 2.1% Obama. Uh, if you look at it from January 1st, 1983, now just think of this, from January 1st, 1983 until June 30th, 1984, that's 18 months? Yeah. A year and a half. U.S. real GDP under Reagan grew by 12%. Hmm. It grew at an average annual rate of a smidgen below 8% per annum. Those are Chinese growth rates. Do you know what that does to your economy, to your budget, to your employment, to your world? You know, it is just an amazing elixir. And by the time we got the 1984 election, Reagan won 49 out of 50 states. Then we got the greatest tax reform bill ever, which was the 86 Tax Act, which I like to think of as sort of my baby. Uh, you know, that was the complete flash. The same one I did for Jerry Brown when he ran for president in 1992. Yeah, Jerry Brown, most people don't know, ran on a flat tax in totally. 1992. What, a 13%? 13% uh, personal, across 13 the board, no exemptions, corporate. no yeah. deductions, no exclusions. Just yeah. you pay your tax, across the board, flat tax. Uh, if you make 10 times as much money as I do, you pay 10 times as much in taxes. Well, I think there may be some people in California that wish he would bring you back as a consultant. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to. <laughs> At least man. the people like leaving it. because they're paying so yeah. much well, in taxes. Well, you know, I don't think he's responsible for all this. You know, yeah. the governor in California is not as powerful as the governor is in other states. No, that's true. Uh, new normal. New normal's 1% one, 1 growth. I mean, I think we all know that, right? That's what they say. <laughs> Larry Summers, here we go again. <laughs> yeah, so what did we talk about the new normal versus uh, the well, 4% that we think we can get. Well, the new normal is, is not the get. new normal. It's yeah. the same as we had under, uh, under Jimmy Carter. We had, yeah. <clears throat> I like to refer to him as the four stooges. Uh, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, and Carter. Uh, the largest assemblage of bipartisan ignorance probably ever put. So that's pretty planet. bipartisan. You got two oh, Ds is, and yeah. two Rs. Two Ds yeah. and two Rs, yeah. but four bads. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know... No party has a monopoly in good or bad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you look at that, we had this horrible period from, from, I think it was from, let's say from 1966, February, I think the stock market peaked at 1,000, if you take the Dow. Mm -hmm. And by uh, August of 1982, just before Reagan's tax cuts took effect, uh, the, the Dow was at 777. Uh, yeah, six something. 770. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it, it's a low number. For 16 and a half years, you had yeah. the stock market decline by 23%. Yeah. If you adjusted it for inflation, the stock market declined at an average annual rate in real terms of 7% per annum compounded for 16 and a half years. That's a bear market. So, so you think it's policy folly that causes low growth? Totally. Well, what about the people that are talking about demographics, lower rate of innovation? You know, no new big things like the well, but jet, big, jet plane, that kind of thing. Well, now, I don't things, necessarily believe that, but, that's, well, but the, that's the narrative. There's a lot of other things besides just taxes and economics. I know there are brilliant geniuses sitting out there that do things on their own that are extra economic. They're not really. 
but economics matters. But but you break it down the four policy areas and yeah. uh, that, uh, is or you've got uh, fiscal, you've got monetary, you've got trade, and we've got what you regulatory. call incomes policy, incomes which policy. is regula yep. which is regulatory. Yes, it is. And you got to get all those right. Well, you, you the more you get right, the better off you're going to okay. be. Okay. Well, you need a low rate, broad based flat tax. All right. That's, Period. That's, that's taxes. All taxes are bad but some are worse than others. And a flat tax is the most efficient way of collecting the money. And what do you do with the tax code? Then you want, well, what you do with the tax code is you have two flat tax rates. One I did was on business net sales or value added, and one on personal unadjusted gross income, and then get rid of all the other taxes. Bingo. And little details, we kept sin taxes because, frankly, they're there not so much to raise money as they are to change behavior. Alcohol, tobacco, it's firearms. It's part of your theme of Fine. incentives. Incentives yes, are disincentives. You're doing it. You want to incent people not to smoke. Then you want spending yeah. restraint. Yeah. Uh, you know, government spending, as Milton always said, is taxation. Government spending is. So you want to collect your taxes where the damage done by the last dollar taxes collected is a little bit less than the benefit done by the last dollar spent. Then you stop already. Can you explain Sound that money. a little bit? Can you amplify that? Government sure. spending is taxation. Could you unpack yeah, you that? Yeah, you know, there is, as Milton says, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. And the way I like to explain it to an audience <clears throat> is if it's good economics, it's scalable. It should work for a big economy, a little economy. Mm -hmm. It should, should work for a two-person economy. And, and it's important because you can understand a two-person economy. It's hard to understand an example in the U.S. economy. Let's imagine we have a two-person economy, Farmer A and Farmer B, all right? That's it. There's nothing else. Just those two farmers. If Farmer B gets unemployment benefits, who do you think pays for them? <laughs> Am I going way over your head on this? I, you know, no, I, I think I got Government this. spending <laughs> is taxation. It, 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 it's called the Slutsky equation. Mm -hmm. You've got the income effects of government programs are twofold. The guy who receives the money gets a positive income effect. The guy who loses the money gets a negative income effect. The income effects always wash to zero, and the substitution effects or the incentive effects always accumulate. By paying someone not to work, you reduce their incentives to work. By taxing someone if they do work, you reduce their incentives to work. It's not, Bill, it's not that you don't do redistribution. You do. But you got to be clear-eyed about it and mm -hmm. understand what the consequences are when you do it. We as a civilized society are going to take care of people who can't take care of themselves. But how far you go depends upon the consequences. Yeah, I like to say you have to be compassionate, but you got to be smart compassionate. Yeah, well, clear-eyed. I just say clear-eyed. Yeah. yeah. You know, you got to have that little green eye shade as well as a big heart. Mm -hmm. Both matter. Well, this when I get into discussions like this, people start saying, "Well, you don't want you know you, you don't want any government." I mean, we, that's not the that's case. Not true. That's not what, true. What kind of government do we need? We when need you talk, a government. When we talk about what is it and what it does is it compassionate do? and yeah. yet does not go beyond yeah. the bounds of good sense. When you when when you create the very problems with a program that you're intending to cure, uh, the joke was that Lyndon Johnson waged the war on poverty, and poverty won. <laughs> because he made it so attractive yeah. that he created the very unemployment that he was trying to get rid of and alleviate the pains from. You've got to be very delicate how far you go on paying people who don't work to make sure that you don't create the incentives so they don't want to work. You know, and it's not easy and it's not simple. There's not a clear answer, that's right, that's wrong. But this is where you want good governance to really be able to draw those, but be very careful about going beyond the bounds with which you're really doing good instead of creating more harm. Hmm. Now, we've compared states, good states, bad states, in terms of economic policy. We've talked about d different presidents and the kind of policies that they have brought about under their administration. You've also got a chapter in the book on countries and an interesting chapter on China. What, uh, tell me about China. I mean, China's so cool. <laughs> I, I mean, it really is. I, I was on the first trip to China with the Nixon White House. I, right. I went there in 1970, in October of 1970. We did the pre-Kissinger trip to China, and I was there with Air Force Two. I went with George Schultz and John Ehrlichman, and I was sort of in charge of the economics of China then, and I just fell in love with China. I just thought they were the most entrepreneurial, wonderful people. I went there with my arms crossed. Hey, good noise. In 1970, I think it was 90% of all production in China went through state-run enterprises. Today, it's less than 10%. Hmm. That's a tax cut. When China, they went from a, a, a currency that remember me that they had no value whatsoever. They then outsourced monetary policy to Alan Greenspan and stabilized the value of their currency, the renminbi. 
Uh, and they, that's, that's sound money. And then what they did was they opened up their borders to trade. So they had free trade, sound money, and tax cuts. And look at the growth this country has had. They have reduced, now let me just, they have reduced poverty more in China in the last 40 years than the earth has ever done all countries combined from the beginning of humanity to the present. Well, what do you say about the people who say China's really rich just running a mercantilist economy where they've got the government directing things, they're building, apart, oh, they're building cities that have no, nobody living there, that they've got a big investment uh, boom that's basically not supported by demand. And, you know, our, our, our President Trump has talked about uh, China being a currency manipulator and, and cheating on trade. So what do we... You know, China is far from perfect, but it's done a great job. And all of this stuff may be right on the little bitty, eep, 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 eep. but when you look at China over the past 50 years, it, it's just spectacular, Bill. And what it has done for the Chinese people is just unbelievably wonderful. It is, it is at least on a par with our own economic So you don't, you don't see China on the verge of, a, of, a, of an infrastructure and building bubble. No, not a big one. Not going okay. back to where they were. No, not at all. They may have a downturn. Yeah. But, but there's nothing like they're going back to being the China of the past. Not at all. It was the, one of the poorest nations on earth on a, on a per capita GNP. It was just, when I went there to uh, Hong Kong in 1970, and I stepped into the new territories there off into China, if you looked at the hovels on the hillsides, average income in China was a little less than 50 bucks a person. I mean, it was just tragic. Look at them now. Look at Hong Kong. Hong Kong will match any city in the earth. Yeah. I mean, it's what they have done with prosperity is spectacular. Now, are they a communist government? Yeah. You know, supply side economics works with democracy. It works with state run <laughs> government. It works. So tax cuts, uh, sound money and free trade. Yes. And that's amazing. I mean, if you look at Turkey's growth recently under Erdogan. Now, you may not like Erdogan for all sorts of other reasons, and they may be very bad, but that man has created a, a machine of economic... Do you realize that Well, Turkish, Singapore's like that. Singapore's like that, too. And yeah. Lee Kuan Yew, especially, sure, yeah. who's very dictatorial. Oh, yeah. And, you know, and it, it, you know, it just it really does. And it worked very much in Germany at the end of the World War II, you know, under... Uh, under Ludwig Erhard, and the tax cuts there were just amazing. Group now it's stopped. I mean, Japan, the same thing has happened. It stopped. Well, this steers uh, this steers us towards trade. Yes. I mean, we've got a president now who says that we're getting we're getting uh, hurt on trade. We've got to come up with uh, what's he call it? Uh, not he he says he's for free trade, but he wants fair trade. So could you break this down for us as to what's a good idea, what's a yeah. bad idea? L let me not, uh, <clears throat> renegotiating the deals with these other countries is fine. Yeah. What you got to understand is that free trade really is a huge plus for everyone. We make some things better than foreigners, and foreigners make some things better than we do. Uh, we and they would be foolish in the extreme. If we didn't sell them those things we make better than they do, in exchange for those things they make better than we do. It's a win-win situation. And when you look at trade, the reason a country exports is to earn the wherewithal to buy imports. If you prohibit imports or put tariffs on imports, it is exactly the same thing as putting a tax or a tariff on exports. What you find happening in this trade is countries' exports are there to earn the imports. And trying to be protectionist on the import side will hurt your export size. And we had that happen with the Smoot-Hawley tariff bill. Now this is 1929, mm -hmm. 30, 31. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had the largest increases in taxes on traded products in the history of the United States, enormous. The volume of trade fell by 80%. The stock market colla collapsed to 10% of what it was. Uh, the unemployment rate went through the ceiling and the trade balance didn't change at all. Our exports declined right with our imports because if we don't import, no one needs to export. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, You've got an interesting example in the book. You call it autarky, a world without trade. Could you explain what that is so we can look about yeah, what, what, I did what, the, world, what the world would look like without what, trade? Yeah, what I did was I used five <clears throat> different countries. The U.S., I forget what we produce, but, uh, uh, you know, and uh, I used to look at the Costa Rica, which produced coffee and bananas. You've got and coffee Africa. in Costa Rica, apples in Ohio, apples kiwis in, Ohio. in New Zealand, uh, and bananas in China, Africa, and silk in China. Yes. Autarky is when you have to consume what you produce, uh, just a home farm. You 
grow your own meat, you grow everything, is, there's no trade. Right. What you then find is when you trade, every one of these trading partners is better off. You know, we think we get a great deal getting coffee from Costa Rica and all, and they think they're great getting apples from Ohio. So that is where you get the trade. The benefits from trade come from consumption and they come from production. We have the consumption gains from trade and the production gains from trade. Both those are winners, winners, winners for everyone. <clears throat> Protectionism hurts everybody. And the, and, the, and the production side is what creates jobs. So uh, when, the we're, when we're building side does industries, too. okay, no, well, explain. Okay. Ex you know, but the, why the do political you work? class is so focused on jobs. Trade's well, supposed let, to protect let's, industries. Let's focus from, on jobs. Okay, let's focus right. on jobs. Why do you work to buy perfume from France? Well, if Sarah, you're not allowed to buy perfume from France, you're not going to, it's a tax on you. You've been talking to Sarah. I have been talking to Sarah. That's true, I have. <laughs> <coughs> and you get, you get production from a sale of goods to foreigners, but you also get domestic consumption, a production, because we get to buy cheaper, better foreign products, and that raises our wage rate, and we want to work more. It's a win, win, win for everyone in this process. It works with jobs, and it works with consumption. But no one on earth wants production without income. I'll let you work all you want, but I'm not going to pay you a penny. How much are you going to work? No, well, let's talk. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there's nothing, there's no advantage to exporting if you don't use the proceeds to import. That's your wage. That's the income you make for exporting. And you make the income from producing in the U.S. by producing goods that other people consume, and they produce goods that you consume. It's the same process. So what about this border adjustment tax that people are talking about? It's, it makes no sense. Uh, you know, first, first what is it? I mean, it's where... Well, that's very complicated, because okay, I read well, Ryan I... and Brady's, yeah. and I, in my paper on it, I quote them all <laughs> over the place, and I don't think they know what it is. But what they are trying to make it to be is a corporate tax on revenues or a corporate subsidy. Uh, all this, this, is, this is what Germany does. Well, no, this is even, no, this is not a value add tax. This is even worse. Okay, well, we're, yeah. What it is, the way we've got I don't get too it, deep into the weeds well, here, I don't but, be, okay. Everything you export is non-taxable. Right. No corporate tax on exports. Okay? And that's everything quite, you import, you can't deduct the, for expenses. Okay, that's, that's, what that's it straightforward. Is, which means that you'll hit your limit on deductions with the first $10 you import. Mm -hmm. All right, you can't deduct it. And then all the rest is just a tariff on imports. All right? And then you have on exports, you have the same thing as subsidy there, and it'll lead, lead to a huge net tariff on traded products. That's what it'll do. And it will prohibit all capital inflows into the U.S. And so in, a, in your perfect world, what kind of taxes or tariffs would we have on trade? Zero? Well, no, uh, not necessarily. But what you want to do is have the lowest possible rate on the broadest possible base. So you provide people with the least incentives to evade, avoid, or otherwise not report taxable income, and you provide them with the least places they can stick their income mm -hmm. without paying tax on it. That, so you have it just so there's no incentive to try to be a tax shelter or do all this other stuff. It's just a broad-based flat tax, just like I did for Jerry Brown. If you do that, you can have a border tax adjustment if you would like. But what you've got to do is you've got to, if you're going to have a border tax adjustment, you subsidize the exports and you tax the imports to make it an expenditure tax. If you don't use a border tax adjustment, it then becomes a production tax. The two combined are about the exact same thing. It's, uh, it's a sales tax versus a production tax. They're very, very similar. But you can do it either way you want. The way the Europeans do it is they do do a border tax adjustment, but not the way Brady and Ryan talk about it. Mm -hmm. Brady and Ryan talk about it as being a broad-based income tax and deductions, which is nonsense. So you're, I think you've been, uh, you've been asked to talk uh, with the administration about uh, corporate income taxes. That's much on people's minds yep. now. But what, uh, what should we do about corporate taxes? Well, right now, I mean, what I would love to see us do is not tax profits, but tax total production. So you don't provide an incentive to lose money. Uh, you know, if you tax profits and subsidize losers, you're going to get bad, worse corporations. But let's not talk about that for the second. The rate. We have the 35... Well, I, I think you've said... One of, one of the things I've read you've said, I think is very interesting. You said, well, let, let's, let's find the most successful companies we can to make the best products, the most productive. Thank you. And... Uh, just just amazing creators of wealth. They, they, they use resources incredibly efficient, so efficiently. So let's 
let's tax them. That's what we Let, do. Let's, let's tax the most <laughs> successful ones. And yes. I don't think people understand. Most corporations don't pay taxes. No, they don't. The reason? Mm-hmm. They don't make any money. Or and the, so, so we're, ta- use, we're taxing yeah. the most successful and the, you know, it's, 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 so talk about reverse incentives. Oh, God. You get this company makes a wonderful product. Everyone wants the product. They make it really efficiently at low cost, and they make it lots of. And they eschew the use of lawyers, accountants, and favor grabbers and lobbyists. They don't do any of that stuff, and we tax the living bejabers out of them. <laughs> then you get Solyndra out there, who allu- makes a lousy product no one wants, makes it really inefficiently. They hire all of these guys to go lobby the government, and they get they get subsidies for that. It makes no sense. What you want to do is tax the use of of natural resources, of resources, labor, and capital, and resources, and tax at a low flat rate and then let the companies uh, be able to make their money if they want it? One of the things I, I always try to get at with these policy discussions is what's the, what's the effect in ordinary people? And I don't think that most people understand that corporate taxes are a tax on them as a consumer. Yeah. And if you work for one, it's a tax on you as, uh, as, uh, as an employee. Worker, yeah. And it's a tax on capital. These are all not good things. And we all get hurt. Is there... Yeah. And we know we have to pay taxes, and, and you're right on this, but what you want to do is collect your taxes in the least damaging fashion. Yeah. And, you know, when you have progressive taxes so that people hire lawyers and accountants instead of producing goods and services and paying their taxes fair and square, the real reason I want a low-rate, broad-based, flat tax is you, they won't use tax shelters anymore, Bill. They won't, they won't cheat on their taxes. They won't try to maximize their tax forms uh, they won't try to shift income out of the... I mean, they'll pay their damn taxes fair and square and then get on to making business. That's what you really want. You want it to be neutral with respect, and then you collect the requisite sums you need to provide government services. And then you stop. Well, you've got seven items in your book that are tax items that people that can escape the least, tax the things you most you like the least, send taxes. Uh, you, you tax the things least uh, where collection costs are the highest. Um, broad-based tax rates provide people with the least incentive to evade, avoid, or otherwise not report taxable income. You tax people fairly. <laughs> yep. You make sure the taxation is not arbitrarily easily subject to, to changes. Yep. And uh, you collect only as much as you need. That's the, what you do. Um, what more do you want than that? Okay. Well, I mean, you know, the thing about taxes is taxes are all bad. Uh, but some is worse than others. And what you want to do is just do it in the least damaging fashion to collect the requisite revenues. And that's and you don't want politicians, especially politicians, to use taxes as weapons against their enemies. You don't want that. You don't want class warfare in the taxes. Now, if you want to help poor people, God bless you. I want to very much. First place, I take the Kennedy phrase, the best form of welfare is still a good high paying job. Okay, that's the number one growth. But there will be some people who don't make it. You write them a check. You know, you do it in a transparent, open, clear, straightforward, warm way. And that way, you know exactly what you're doing. Well, I think one of the things that's underappreciated is how much the tax code is used as a revenue-raising device for politicians when they're running for office. I mean, that's uh, the tax code and the regulatory structure basically provide enormous incentives for people to come Hewitt lobby Long. and write checks. Don't tax you. Don't tax me. Tax the man behind the He's, tree. He we long. <laughs> 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 long. Don't you remember that one? It was great. <laughs> yes, of course they do that. Yeah. And then they go out and solicit funds from the industries and all that. If you had a low rate flat tax, there yeah. wouldn't be any of this solicitation. The politician. Now, the last one, you want now how to the politicians will hate you for a flat tax unless you ready for this one. I'm ready. The problem with politicians is they spend other people's money and they do not bear the consequences of their own actions. So my solution to politicians, put them on commission. If you have GDP growth of 3%, the politicians get their pay. If GDP growth is 4%, double pay. 5% growth, triple pay. I don't mind them making money as long as I do, but if it's 2% growth, they get no pay at all. If it's 1% growth, they owe the people their pay. Well, you, and you know, if you made them to bear the consequences of their own actions, they would all of a sudden behave very differently than they do right now. Just the way companies do, just the way everything else, politicians need to be on a merit pay basis. 
period. You and that is the one thing that would really work. You mentioned Jackie Mason in here. He says, if we want politicians to be successful, put them on a commission and don't pay them until they show a profit. Yes. <laughs> I love Jackie Mason. <laughs> I mean, what a co and he gets roars and laughter from the crowds when he says that. I don't, but he does. <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so the uh, tax cuts on the rich. We, we, you know, we were, the yeah. theme of this show is obviously taxes because that's, You've got, you probably know more about taxation than anybody else on the planet. Tax cuts on the rich, why do they work? And isn't that just trickle down and well, then trickle down a bad thing? A names, you can call them names, but sticks yeah. and stones will break my bones, but names, will, you can use any name you want to. And yeah. I had one by Galbraith when I had their debate with him at Harvard, and he referred to my tax theory as, if you feed the horse enough oats, the sparrow will survive on the highway. <laughs> <laughs> That's his version of trickle down. Uh, we've had three major periods of huge tax cuts on the rich. The 1920s, we cut the highest tax rate in the top 1% of income earners from 77% to 25%. Pretty big cut. When that happened, we have detailed data on the income from the top 1% of income earners. What you find happening in the 1920s is when you cut tax rates on the rich, revenues from the rich, the top 1%, went way up. They went from about 30% of total taxes to over 60% of total taxes. And their rate was less than a third of what it had been before. Hmm. And the revenues went way. Another good example, John F. Kennedy cut the highest rate from 91% to 70%, cut the lowest rate from 20% to 14%. All right, the top 1% of income earners, the, the 90%, 70% people, Revenues went through the ceiling during that period. And lastly, we had the Reagan period where we cut it. Revenues from the top 1% of income earners, tax revenues only, not all the secondary effects, which are huge too. Tax revenues from the top 1% went from 1.5% of GDP in 1981 to 3.2% of GDP in 2004. It more than doubled. Every other category it went down because of tax rate reductions, but the rich are really sensitive to tax rates. And every time we've cut the highest rate, every time revenues have gone up, not down. So something else is going on though, besides revenue increases or decreases, we talk about tax rates. I mean, it, it, we, we started out talking about politics and economics. I think there's a certain amount of class warfare. There's a certain amount of just, uh, we're not going to do this because you're rich and we're not. I yep, mean, that's what, right. how, do you, how do you cut through that with our politics? I don't know. Yeah, I, we, I, you know, every now and then the stars are aligned and good economics wins. Yeah. And then when people get rich, they feel guilty, and then bad economics starts winning again. But then we always come back to winning. Uh, you know, we won with the Harding and Coolidge after a long period of Wilson uh, and Taft, and it was really a bad period there. And then all of a sudden we got Harding and Coolidge and really a great eight-year period there of the 20s. And then you got the Roosevelt bad period all the way through until Jack Kennedy. And then you got a very short window of the go-go 60s, which was really spectacular. And then you got the Four Stooges, which I call the Four Stooges. Uh, <laughs> that that 16-year period of Johnson, Nixon, Ford, and Carter. Uh, and then you got the Reagan prosperity. Reagan through Clinton, by the way. Clinton was a great president. And then we went to the Dark Ages once again with W and Obama. I don't see really much difference between Obama and W. I mean, they were twins to me in mm -hmm. economics. Well, and they both gave us, uh, you know, the, the, the bailout packages and oh, the stimulus in, in 2008. The, the story I like is we had a sharp economic turndown in 1920. And I love the dramatic policy action that President Harding took. Yes. Nothing. Like, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. And, that's he, beautiful. and everything came roaring back without a, now, without a single... Let, uh, me let me take you through the Harding, because the Harding one's fascinating. Okay. Harding and Coolidge won the election by the largest percentage ever. They ran on a slogan of a return to normalcy, which means cutting tax rates way back to where they were before World War I. Now, if you know they're going to cut tax rates way down next year, what do you do this year? Mm. You defer all the income. Sure. The, the recession of, 80, of 1920, 21, 22 was caused by the tax cuts in the future. And then we got the Roaring Twenties and the huge boom that occurred, which I expect. Same thing happened with Kennedy. And the same thing happened with Reagan. When we came in, everyone knew we were gonna cut tax rates way down. So we got this deferral effect until the tax cuts did come down. Our tax cuts began on January 1st, 1983. <laughs> Guess when the boom started? Hmm. January 1st, 1983. It is amazing how tax cuts don't work. 
until they take effect. <laughs> and then they work like, and it's the same problem you always have is because the anticipation of a tax cut is depressing to an economy. So you have that initial downturn, but then you get the boom that goes crazy. With everything going on in the world, you, you are also a money manager. Where, where are you allocating your capital? Well, I, 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 we do a global one. We do a global thing, which is uh, we look at uh, a number of ETFs in different countries, and we look at all the policies of all these different countries. So you have a policy-based economic... Oh, totally. Uh, okay. And we look at the four pillars of prosperity, just what you went through, mm -hmm. monetary policy, trade policy, incomes policies, and fiscal policy, taxes. Mm -hmm. And we look at countries that are changing their policies. For example, we've gone very heavily into France mm -hmm. because we think Macron is much better than Hollande. Hmm. And there, so this is how we judge all of these, and we keep very close track of all of these countries, and then we select them. We are allowed to have only two emerging market countries because, you, frankly, they're Brazil, a little wild, they're crazy, volatile. Yeah. little. So we have that, and we've been doing that for years and years and years, and it's worked out pretty nicely. We also have a macro one, which is again policies in which industries do well under tax cuts, under spending, blah blah blah. We mm -hmm. call it high cats, low cats. Tradable, non-tradables. What's a high cat? High cats. Oh, well, capital tax sensitivity. Okay. We call it cats. All right. <laughs> but you, you know, if you look at what happened when Kennedy did uh, the tax cuts, you yeah. found a very strong pattern of industries' performances. The same pattern occurred with Reagan. Uh, the same pattern we believe is going to occur in the future here because of we're back to a growth agenda. So when you look at it. Prosperity is not evenly distributed amongst all industries and all companies. It's not. For example, gold generally doesn't do really well during a prosperity, uh, nor do tax shelters. Don't do, I'm joking with mm -hmm. you. And yeah. other industries do really well. Yeah. And so what we try to do is find that pattern and overlay that pattern with what we think the policies are going on in the U.S. And then we select those industries. Uh, and then we select those states. We look at the states and where the companies are located, both where their capital is located, where their labor is located, mm -hmm. and where their sales are located. And we try to be in states. Now, I'm on a board of a company called NXRT, and I'm obviously vested heavily in it. Yeah. But they look at states for development of, of real estate investment trust, our REIT. And we're doing really, really well uh, because we are very careful in where we buy the real estate as well as how well we buy it. Hmm. But you don't want to be in states like California or other places where they have high tax and yeah. you're going to get low growth. You just don't want to be there. Are Makes sense? I, it makes a ton of sense. I'm going to call my broker. Uh oh. And, uh, <laughs> but you know, some of these are really. I love being. I, I, I think in. this is a. How, how are the returns compared to uh, the benchmarks? Are, oh, you, are you able to disclose I, that? I obviously, I yeah, for sure. I, I think we're doing real. You're well. doing pretty well. <laughs> you can look. You can look up. It's a New York Stock Exchange company, NXRT. Okay. okay. And I'm on probably ten or twelve company boards. Yeah. I love applying the economics on a personal level as sure. well as on a U.S. level, as well as on a global level. As you know, I did with Thatcher. I, I worked with her. I was the only American really involved in the policy stuff with her. It, it's really fun, and it, and it works, Bill. It really works. So, if you want prosperity. Well, last topic. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's now summer of 2017. We have a new administration. How much of what we're talking about that you want to, Bring about? Do you think we can bring about with uh, with the current political? We can political, bring about uh, a lot of it. And one of the areas which I try to stay out of is politics. But but let me drift a little bit because politics <clears throat> is where the rubber hits the road. Yes, that's where economics is applied. And yep. you know, we we did a good job with Reagan and the eighty one tax act, fine and all that. But the real winner was eighty six tax act. That mm -hmm. was the we brought the rates down to twenty eight percent. Pretty amazing corporate rate. We dropped a lot too. To get a bipartisan consensus, you need a resounding political victory. Now, we had a terrible time in 82. We lost a lot of House seats. We lost mm -hmm. one Senate seat yeah. because our tax cuts hadn't started. But as I remember, I talked to you about the growth rate from January 1st all through that, 83, 84. If you look at 84, we won 49 states out of 50. We swept the world. Everyone wanted to be a Reaganite. And then we were able to get bipartisan consensus the 86 Tax Act, which is the best bill ever, the vote in the Senate was 97 to 3. Hmm. You know, once you have a big victory and then everyone works together, you then get really constructive bipartisan. We need that victory first. And it may or it may not come. It's dependent on lots of other stuff. But I would wait for the massive, big one 
till later on in this administration. And now I just dropped that corporate rate from 35 to 15%. Mm -hmm. That'll be a direct adrenaline shot right to the heart of the economy and boom, get us going. But if you did that, and don't worry about all the reforms and all the other stuff now, once we get the political process rolling, once the growth starts, Bill, it doesn't stop. I mean, everyone then wants to get on board. Well, you know, just to review, at 35%, we've got the highest corporate tax rate in the, the world. Uh, world. Yes. And we are seeing companies fleeing the United States. We have inversions. We have all sorts of Tons reasons of it's to all not be here. And taking it from 35 to 15 would be a one-time shot in the arm that would make us an investment haven yes. rather than a... Only uh, Ireland would be lower than we are. Ireland, we'll let Ireland off. I love we, Ireland. You know, we have a Do you know Irish. why everyone's investing in Ireland, Bill? Do you know that? <laughs> uh, because the that. capital uh, is yeah. always Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank so, you. <laughs> Art, thank you. My pleasure, Please come Bill. back and uh, lots to learn and uh, hope you're effective here in Washington on your travels this time. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, thank you. It's great fun. Yeah. Art Laffer is one of the clearest thinkers I know. And what he calls his four pillars of prosperity provides the playbook for economic growth. Tax cuts, sound money, free trade, light regulation. Economic policies matter, and these four pillars work. We're seeing it playing out today. Bad policies caused the so-called new normal of 1% growth under the poor economic leadership of both President Bush and President Obama. Regardless of what you think about Trump, there's no doubt we're seeing better tax and regulatory regimes. Business optimism is picking up. The economy is growing again. You won't read about this too much because the media doesn't want to report positive economic news with Trump in office. Yet this growth is good for everyone. And we can thank Art Laffer for being one of the pioneers who showed us the way. Thanks for listening. Want more? Be sure to subscribe at thebillwaltonshow.com or on iTunes.